Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will take hold of it, be a doer of it. We thank you for the fruit that will come forth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. Today we're going to share with you on the subject of the covenant of sanctification and holiness that God wants to bring forth in your life. We've been talking about going on to be the perfected church and seeing God accomplish everything that He wants. And certainly, sanctification must happen in our lives to bring forth holiness before the Lord. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Notice, He's commanding them to be sanctified. God is commanding us to be sanctified today. We talk about what sanctified means. It means to be separate, to be consecrated, to be dedicated, to be purified, to be cleansed, and to become holy. You and I are to be set apart unto the Lord and to walk in His ways. We see, he goes on in verse 8 and he says, You shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctifieth you. As you and I keep the Word of God and be a doer of it consistently, then God will accomplish this work. When it talks about this Jehovah, this is the word Jehovah, translated Lord, but it's really the word Jehovah in the Old Testament. And this is the word Kadosh. This is a compound covenant name, Jehovah Kadosh, which is the Lord who sanctifies you. It is a covenant-keeping name. This is part of the covenant that you and I have. He wants to bring forth the covenant of sanctification to be manifest in your life. We see over back in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, we see in verse 3, where he talks about sanctification at the beginning. He said, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his works, all his work which God created and made. Six days he worked, seventh day he rested. The day is like a thousand years. Six thousand years will be the days of man doing all the things, working out his own salvation, doing the works of God. Then the next one, the 7,000th year, that's the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And that is the time where there'll be holiness, holiness. The seventh day, speaking of the 7,000th year, which we'll be approaching down the road here, will be sanctified and holy unto the Lord. We can even see that that is spoken of when, after Jesus comes back, and sets up his millennial reign in Zechariah chapter 14, over in verse 20. It speaks, In that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. That's what it's going to be in that time. Holiness unto the Lord. God wants us to realize that we are going to be a people that are going to be holy before the Lord. Now, how is he going to accomplish this and perform this covenant of sanctification and holiness in our life? Well, how does God do everything? He does it through his word. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We are come over to verse 15. He says that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. The scriptures are holy. The word of God is holy, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So it's through the Holy Scriptures of the Word of God. We see this also spoken of in the Old Testament, in Jeremiah, in chapter 23. We see over in verse 9, where he says, Mine heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I'm like a drunken man, like a man whom wine hath overcome because of the Lord and because of the words of His holiness. His words are holy words. We need to understand that. God's Word is something that we should approach and realize it is holy. And it, God is doing a work in us as the Word of God is coming into us. And He also <clears throat> does this work by the Holy Spirit. It speaks here in Romans chapter 1 verse 4, how Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. The Spirit of holiness will work in order to accomplish this great work to see you and I come into the manifestation of this covenant of holiness. Now, it begins with sanctification in spirit. 
We see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, over here in verse 13. Now we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning, beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Otherwise, the first thing that happens is you and I get born again. We get a brand new spirit on the inside of us. We are sanctified now in spirit because we have believed the truth of the Word of God. Every one of us get born again and we get a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ, and that spirit is holy. That spirit is sanctified. And so God wants us to realize that's the first step. But that's not all there is to it. We also see in Exodus chapter 13, it talks about in verse 2 when the Lord spoke to Moses saying in verse 2, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn. Throughout the Old Testament, the firstborn were always sanctified, separated, dedicated, consecrated to Him. Well, what is the church? It's the church of the firstborn. So when you become born again, you are sanctified, you are separated, you are dedicated, you are consecrated unto the Lord. You've been bought with a price. You belong to Him now. Sanctification begins when you and I are born again and it, as it, we get a new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, this work, though, doesn't stop there. In Isaiah chapter 35, you and I are now to go forth and see this work be accomplished in all areas of our life. In Isaiah 35, verse 8, it says, A highway shall be there and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The way that the Lord has set for us is a way of holiness that you and I are going to walk in. The unclean shall not pass over it, otherwise we're not going to have any uncleanness in us if we're going to walk in the way of holiness. It shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. It says, No lion shall be there, nor ravenous beast shall go up there upon. It shall not be found there. But who is going to walk this way? The redeemed shall walk there in this way of holiness. The way of holiness is a way for the redeemed, and those are the ones that have been purchased. And the ransomed, or the redeemed of the Lord, shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Notice, you and I are going to come to the place of obtaining joy and gladness as we are walking in line with the Word, possessing promises, and seeing God accomplish everything. And all sorrow and sign is to flee away in our life. A way of holiness has been set before us. We go back to Exodus chapter 19. In Exodus 19, we see that we get here in the third month when the children of Israel came out of the land, out of land, land of Egypt, and we're going to go towards the promised land that God was going to give them. This third month is Siwan, which is talking about the time of Pentecost, what it's pointing towards, which was the birthday of the church, when the church was born. And so this speaks of the church age beginning. And we see in verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, Go into the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. What is this speaking of? Today and tomorrow is two days. That is the church age. The church age is 2,000 years long. For 4,000 years from Adam to Christ, the first four days, the next two days are the church age. And what does he say is supposed to happen? We're to be sanctified during that church age, which are the two days. And let them wash their clothes. This washing is washed by a fuller, which is to wash yourself as white as snow. God wants us to be washed. He wants us to be cleansed. He wants us to be sanctified. And that is the work that God is going to accomplish in the body of Christ during the church age, if we're following Him. Verse 14, Moses went down from the mount of the people. He sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. Moses is a type of Christ, and He is the one who is doing this work in you and me, bringing a sanctification and also a washing we are to be washed clean, to be holy before the Lord. We see over in verse 22. Let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. Otherwise, we come to the presence of the Lord, we've got to be holy before Him. 
And here it speaks about the priests. Well, in the New Testament age, you and I are the priests. And God wants us to be sanctified, to be holy before the Lord. Now we see over in Exodus chapter 28, further talking about the priests, we see in verse 41, 28, 41, he speaks here, he says, Look, put them on Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shall anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's offices. Well, they're putting on the garments of the priesthood. And so they were to be anointed, consecrated, sanctified. Consecrated means they're going to be filled up with the things of God. They're going to be sanctified, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. If you're going to be able to successfully minister unto the Lord and for the Lord, you've got to be sanctified, be holy before the Lord. He's a holy God, and He's only going to manifest Himself in a holy people. So what did they do? They make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. Linen speaks of righteousness in the Scripture. Righteousness is going to be put on in our life, that we would walk in righteousness. That's what produces holiness in our life. God wants it every one of us to be obedient to the word of righteousness so fruits of righteousness come forth in our life he goes on and says to Aaron they shall be upon Aaron upon his sons when they come in into the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place they shall not bear shall bear not iniquity and die it shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him that tells you it's not just for the Old Testament but it was for the seed and who's the seed always referring to? It's referring to Christ. Tells us talking about, carries over to the New Testament age. You and I are not to carry or bear iniquity or sin in our life. We are to conquer it and overcome all iniquity. Otherwise, it said these ones that would bear iniquity and try to come into the presence of God, they would die. God wants us to deal with all areas of sin in our life. And then we come over to chapter 29. And in chapter 29, where they were washed and then they were anointed and for the priesthood, and in verse 20, it says, Thou shalt kill the ram and take of his blood and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron, upon the tip of the right ear of his sons, upon the thumb of their right hand, and upon the great toe of their right foot, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. So blood was to be applied to the tip of the ear, the right hand, and also the foot. What does that mean? The blood speaks of the blood of Jesus that is to be applied to us. And what is this all? This is all our members, isn't it? With what we hear, we put our hands to, the steps we walk in. In other words, you and I are to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ in all aspects in our life. And that, of course, is going to be because we're going to walk in line with the Word of God. When we yield our members unto walking in obedience to the Word, the blood of Jesus Christ will keep us cleansed from all unrighteousness, and we will be holy before the Lord. In fact, we can even see this, even speaks of this, that if you and I will walk in the light, over in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. It will keep us cleansed. Therefore, you and I are to have our members cleansed, yielded unto God, so that we will be holy in all areas of our life. He does not want anything to be coming into us that's evil, that would be contaminating us, any sin affecting us through yielding our members unto anything that's contrary to His Word. We see another thing. Over in Exodus 29, 43, he says, There I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Who's the tabernacle today? You and I are. God doesn't dwell in an Old Testament tabernacle. He dwells in us. We're the temple of God, the tabernacle of God. He's dwelling in you and me. And how is this sanctification process going to work? It's going to work by His glory. The glory of God being manifested in you, the presence of God, will bring forth the sanctification work as well. And that is important to realize. You and I are to be changed into the very image of Jesus Christ. And we're going to go from glory to glory. It talks about here in 2 Corinthians 
chapter 3, verse 18, we all with open face beholding as a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image, into the image of Jesus Christ, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So, as the presence of God is being manifest in your life, it does a work in you. It changes you. The sanctification comes forth. God, that's why you want to be praisers and worshipers of God and enter into the presence of God so He can accomplish this great work in your life. We also see in Exodus chapter 40, speaking of what all is involved in seeing this covenant of sanctification and holiness come forth in our life, in speaking to Aaron, he says in verse 13, Thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments, and anoint him, and sanctify him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. The holy garments. The garments of God are to be put on through the word in us, and they are holy. It's as if you're putting on spiritual clothes. Holy clothes are to be put upon us. He wants us also to stay away from everything that is not clean before the Lord. We see in Exodus chapter 10, verse 3, Moses said to Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. God wants us to know that we're going to be sanctified for those that come nigh him according to his word. And he's going to, we're going to be glorified. He's going to, we're going to be, all the people, he said he would be glorified in us as we walk in the ways of the word. And we also see, come down to verse 9, he says, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die because it contaminates you. Wine and strong drink contaminate you. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. He says that you may put difference between the holy and the unholy, between the unclean and the clean. Otherwise, speaking the fact that the alcohol and the strong drink would be unholy and unclean. We want to put a difference between these things and separate ourselves from those things. We're not to be partaking of those things and allowing ourselves to, to be filled up with this. We also see in Leviticus 11, over in verse 44, he says, I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves. You shall be holy, for I am holy. Again, notice, God's going to do this work, but we see we're supposed to have a part to play. You've got to sanctify yourself. You have something to do with it. For I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Nothing was def defiled them in the Old Testament. It's all these th creeping things. But God wants us to, of course, in the New Testament, not to be defiled with any spiritual thing that would come into us that is unclean. And remember the first scripture that we looked at. How are we going to see this sanctification come forth? To be sanctify ourselves, be holy? It's because you and I keep and do the statutes, which is the Word of God. As you keep and do the word, the word which is holy, the word which is full of power, as you do that word, it, God will manifest himself and bring forth his sanctification in your life. We see in Numbers, chapter 8, over in verse 6, he says, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them. Again, they were the priests, got to be cleansed. And thou shalt do unto them, this is what, this, thus shalt thou do unto them to cleanse them. This is what needs to be done. Sprinkle the water of purifying upon them. The water is a type of the word. The word of God is going to bring a purifying effect in you. Let them shave all their flesh. Cut off all the things that are not of the Lord. That speaks of us crucifying the flesh and cutting off all the fleshly works in our life. Let them wash their clothes. This is the wash like a fooler, washing white as snow. And so make themselves clean. We've got to wash ourselves, get cleansed, get rid of all the fleshly works. Get this word in us that is going to make the change in our life. Verse 15. After that shall the Levites go in to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Thou shalt cleanse them and offer them for an offering. They could only serve the Lord when they were cleansed. In like manner, God is going to raise up a mighty army of vessels that are going to be serving the Lord, carrying out the ministry of the Lord, and it's going to be for those who are holy, those who are sanctified, those that are cleansed before the Lord. We see a statement made in Numbers chapter 20 regarding Moses. 
verse 12. <coughs> the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron. He said, Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation to the land which I have given them. That's because instead of speaking to the rock the second time, he smote it twice, which was a mistake. And so he says, because you believe me not. He didn't believe. That tells us another thing. As we believe God's word and we walk by faith and we're obedient to it, that also works sanctification in our life. We are to believe his word, do exactly what he says, never doubt his word, obey it. We see further, he speaks in Numbers 27. Verse 14, he says, For you rebelled against my commandment, the desert of Zin, and the strife of the congregation, to sanctify me at the water before their eyes. So not only did he not believe, but he rebelled against what God said. Believe God's word and do what he says, not rebel. He rebelled, and of course, it cost him. See, God is at work to bring forth a holy body of, body of Christ. In Deuteronomy 32, we see another scripture in verse 51. Again, he's speaking to Moses a third time here. Because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah, Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, because you sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel. So he didn't believe, he rebelled, and he transgressed against God. He committed sin. And anytime we rebel, we're committing sin. Anytime we don't believe, we're actually committing sin, whether we realize it or not. And we're not sanctifying the Lord. We do that as we walk in line with His ways. We must understand, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, in verse 14, before Jesus comes back for the church, He's coming in the church to find out who is going to walk in His ways. It says in Deuteronomy 23, 14, this is a point towards this, For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp, the camp is a type of the church, to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy. The church is to get delivered, to get set free from all bondages, and the church is to come to the place of being holy before the Lord. That he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. The word unclean here means nakedness. He wants no nakedness spiritually in our life. Remember, what do they do? They put the linen breeches on, which is righteousness for the nakedness. That means that he's expecting you and I to get delivered from all of our enemies and also to put on righteousness, walk in righteousness, so that then that will produce fruit unto holiness in our life. Notice what happens if he sees the fact that you and I are not holy and we are not righteous or we have nakedness in us. It says he will turn away from us. Will he manifest himself in a church that is not righteous and is not holy? No. He will turn away from us. That shows you there's going to be a remnant are going to be holy before the Lord, and he's going to manifest himself in them. But the ones who haven't done the work and seen this covenant of sanctification and holiness accomplished, they're going to be turned away from. They're not going to see God manifest himself in their life in these last days. Over in Joshua, Chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, we see over here in verse 5. Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves. Again, notice the responsibilities are on our part as we hear the word, do the word, so God can accomplish this work. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. These are miraculous works. Notice, being sanctified precede him doing the miraculous works. This is why We've got to go through the sanctification process, see this covenant of sanctification and holiness come forth in our life, and then God says he'll do wonders. Many today, they want to see the signs and wonders and the miracles happen right now, but they haven't gone through, they haven't sanctified themselves. God wants you to sanctify ourselves, to be cleansed, to be holy, to be dedicated to the Lord, prepared, be separate from all things that are not of, of him, consecrated, set apart. That's all what this word means. You are to be set apart unto the Lord and to walk in His ways. Certainly, we cannot have sin in our life. We cannot be walking contrary to His way. We see over in Joshua chapter 7, where it speaks of the children of Israel that committed a trespass in the accursed thing. Were they able to win any battles then? No. Instead, they were cursed. 
It says over here in verse 12, Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies because they were accursed, because they had sin in their life. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel, and thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. We've got to get rid of anything that's accursed, anything that's sin, anything that's unclean, anything that's unholy. It's all got to go. Otherwise, we can't stand before enemies. Who's our enemy? The devil. The devil will be able to come in. He'll be able to come in if we have the open door. That's why we've got to close the door and get rid of it. They couldn't win their battle. They got defeated by the enemy. The devil will be able to defeat you if you have open doors of sin and you haven't taken anything that is accursed, anything that is evil. It must be eliminated. And we don't just deal with some of the areas in our life. God wants to deal with everything. Joshua 22, verse 17. He says, Is the iniquity or this wickedness, this perversity of pure too little for us? from which we're not cleansed until this day, although there was a plague in the congregation of the Lord. Otherwise, there was a plague that came. Why? Because they weren't cleansed. And what was the problem? They didn't deal with all the iniquity. Is there iniquity too little for us? Otherwise, hey, we've got to deal with it all. We can't just deal with part of it. A little sin is going to contaminate the whole thing. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. God wants us to deal with all the areas of sin in our life. And yet even if we have a little bit of iniquity, that still means we're not cleansed. And that allowed the plague to come into the congregation, which brought destruction before them. God wants us to be sanctified before the Lord. See this process, this, this covenant of sanctification and holiness be manifest in you. And He will do this work as you obey Him. 1 Samuel 16, verse 5. He said, Peaceably, I'm come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. What kind of a sacrifice do we offer up today? A sacrifice of praise and worship unto Him? A sacrifice of ourselves doing all the things that He wants us to do, doing the works of God, doing good works, carrying out the service of the Lord? So that's what God wants for us. We are to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. So he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. Notice, before they were really going to participate in the service of the Lord effectively, they had to be sanctified. That's why God wants us to see this covenant of sanctification and holiness be worked out in our life, so you and I will be holy. And then as we come to sacrifice and minister unto the Lord, He will receive and manifest Himself in our midst, and He will use us as we reach out to others at the same time. We see over in 2 Chronicles, in chapter 5, something else. Here is where Solomon finished the work in the house of the Lord. Solomon's temple is a type of the church in Scripture, and it talks about a type of the work being finished in the church, the end-time church, right before the end. And we see that this all occurred at the, in the time of the seventh month. The seventh month is when this occurred. Seventh month in the Hebrew calendar is the month Tishri, and that is the time pointing towards the second coming of Jesus Christ, because those three feasts are fulfilled in His second coming. It also is pointing towards the end time work in the church being finished and accomplished before the coming of the Lord. And so this work being finished, we come down to verse 11. came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified. Otherwise, at this time, all the priests are going to be sanctified, the ones that are following the Lord and walking in His ways. They're going to be totally consecrated, dedicated, separate, set apart, doing all the things that God wants, following the Lord 100%. That's what God's going to bring you to. Verse 12, also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, Hethan, Judges them, their sons and brethren, being arrayed in white linen. What's the linen? It's all about righteousness. They have this white, cleansed righteousness. They've got clean garments. Remember, we're to be clean, cleansed, by, washed like the fooler to become white. White linen is righteousness. 
having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar with 120 priests sounding with trumpets. The number 120 in Scripture has to deal with the change from one age to another. 120, there were 120 in the upper room, weren't there, when there was a change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Here it's talking about the time of the change from the New Testament age, which is this is all pointing towards the work being finished in the New Testament age, to the next age, which is the millennial age, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It speaks of what the church will be like at the time of the end when the millennial reign is going to come into manifestation. They are going to be arrayed in white linen. They are going to be sanctified. And they, it says, as they came to pass, the trumpeters and singers were as one. What are we going to come to? We're going to be one. To make one sound. God wants us to be perfectly joined together in one. One sound, one mind, one mouth, walking uprightly in one accord. Make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, praising and worshiping Him. When they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever, that the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. Who's the house of the Lord? You and I are. And the corporate house of the Lord will be those believers that are now going to be sanctified, righteous, being one, following the way of the Lord. <laughs> and what happened? The priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. That's what's going to happen in the end time church. For the ones that are sanctified, that have become one, that have been righteous, come to the place where they are walking in the way of the Lord, the glory of the Lord is going to fill this end time church because they have seen this work of sanctification accomplished. Second Chronicles 7, verse 16. Now I have chosen and sanctified this house. And the house again is pointing towards the church. That my name be, may be there forever and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. Notice, his eyes and his heart will be there. See, when God's sanctification work is accomplished, He's coming to dwell in us, to manifest Himself. And we are going to be like His eyes and His heart. We will have His heart. We will have His eyes. We'll be able to see, spiritually see as He sees, so that we will walk in the ways of the Lord. We need to have spiritual perception. And we need to have His heart that we would walk in the ways. And how is that going to happen? Through the Word and through the sanctification process being accomplished. As for thee, if thou wilt walk before me, as David thy father walked, do according to all that I have commanded thee, and shall observe my statutes and my judgments, I will establish the throne of thy kingdom. So as you and I walk the walk, we are going to be established in the kingdom, which is the rule and the reign of God. You and I are going to rule and reign over all of our enemies. He said, if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I'll pluck them up by the roots out of the land which I've given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name will I cast out of my sight and will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. That tells you something. That means if anybody who does not continue to follow the Lord and turns away and forsakes them, they're in trouble. They're going to be cast out. They're cast out of his sight. See, you've got to, the work of God accomplished in your life to bring sanctification is to be a permanent work that's going to be continuing on in your life because that's the way you walk. We can't turn back. We can't be turned back whatsoever or we're going to be cast out of His sight. We see in 2 Chronicles 29, speaking of Hezekiah here, and in verse 5, he gave directions to the Levites, the Levites of the priests. You and I are priests today. He said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Notice, he's speaking to the priests, and he tells them again, sanctify yourselves. That means you and I have a part to play in this sanctification process. Sanctify the house of the Lord. That's you and me, because you and I are the house of the Lord. Carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. The whole Old Testament had three parts, the holy of holies, the holy place, the outer court. They're likened to the spirit, the holy of holies like the spirit, the holy place like the soul, the outer court like the physical body. This is talking about bringing the filthiness out of the holy place that's likened to you bringing the, whole, the filthiness out of the soul. 
Our soul needs to be cleaned up. We got to get rid, rid of everything that would be affecting us in our mind, in our will, our emotions, in the soulish realm. It is all to be brought out. We are to be cleansed before the Lord. In verse 15, they gathered their brethren and sanctified themselves, came according to the commandment of the king by the word of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. What is God doing today? He's gathering those who are going to walk the walk of the Lord. And they're going to see this covenant of sanctification and holiness be accomplished. They're going to sanctify themselves. They're serious about walking in the way of the Lord. That's what you are. That's what this place is. That's what God wants for every, all Christians. And they came according to the commandment of the king. This is the commandment of the king, not a suggestion. By the word of the Lord, to cleanse the house of the Lord. God wants you and I cleansed. You and I must be cleansed if we're going to see the Lord manifest himself as he purposes in our life. Verse 16, the priests, that's you and I, remember you and I are priests, went into the inner part of the house of the Lord. That means you're going to go inside in you and you're going to cleanse and bring out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. You need to take a good look at everything that's in your life and anything that's unclean, it needs to be driven out. We can't allow any evil to be in us. And you're going to be looking. Just everything in you needs to come up to come out. Everything needs to be dealt with. We aren't going to be able to carry on and think that, you know, little things here that nobody knows we're going to get away with. No, everything needs to be dealt with. All attitudes, any resentments, bitterness, anger, unforgiveness, lawful, laziness, rebellion, disobedience, stubbornness, you know, all these kind of things. Inner attitudes, negative attitudes. They got to be dealt with. Everything that the that all the uncleanness that's found in you, God says, bring it out. It's all time to get rid of it, and that would include, of course, all the evil spirits that we're going to cast out as well. Everything has to go. All the works of the flesh have to be eliminated. Verse 17. They began on the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. Notice. It took a period of time to do it. That speaks of the fact that it is a process of sanctification in your life. It's not going to happen overnight. As you're working out your salvation, you will see this be accomplished. And it's interesting, the word eight in Scripture is the word for new beginnings, which means that after this process is accomplished, after eight days of you working it out in your life, and don't think of it as literal days, but just a process of time, you will come to the place of be, as, as, as being a new beginning in your life because you'll have cleansed all this evil out of you, all this filthiness. Just think if you've got all these demons out, you've got all this evil out, and you're holy and clean as ever. God can really use you. God can really manifest himself in your life and do great things. That's why we want to see this work of sanctification be accomplished. Well, some of them were being obedient and doing what they were supposed to do. 2 Chronicles 29, 34 says, But the priests were too few, so that they could not flay all the burnt offerings where their, for their brethren the Levites did help them, till the work was ended, until the other priests had sanctified themselves. For the Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. Otherwise, one group did what they were supposed to do. They were upright in heart, and they sanctified themselves. That was just a few. The rest of them were lagging behind. They were waiting for the rest of the priests to sanctify themselves. What shows who does this work? Yeah, it comes down to what's in your heart. The ones who were more upright in heart, hey, they dealt with things. God's looking on your heart and my heart. We want to be upright in heart. We want to see this work be done. We don't want to be lagging behind because we haven't dealt with everything in our heart. That shows you that if you're going to see the covenant of sanctification and holiness accomplished, your heart must be pure and holy. We talked about it last week, how we are to have a perfect heart. He wants you to have a perfect heart before the Lord so he can accomplish this great and mighty work. Well, we see in verse 35, also the burnt offerings were in abundance with fat of the peace offerings and the drink offerings for every burnt offering. So the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. Notice, service was set in order when the sanctification was accomplished. You, to be a servant of the Lord and to serve Him as God would have you to serve Him, will be set in order when the sanctification is complete. See, you'll see this when we get over the New Testament. We're to be a vessel of honor, sanctified, meet 
for the master's use, so we're usable, prepared unto every good work. You'll see this when we see this in the New Testament scriptures. So these guys did this. And it says, Hezekiah rejoiced in all the people that God had prepared the people, for the thing was done suddenly. That speaks of the fact that it all of a sudden happened. This really is prophetic of at the end time church, there's going to be those that will be lagging behind, unfortunately. There'll be ones that are going to do it, and they're going to be used of the Lord. But there will be a group that will finally come along, and they'll get done suddenly to see this great work, because they're going to realize that they need to get themselves sanctified, and they're going to get this work done in their life. Don't be lagging behind. Be what God wants you to be today. Let him accomplish this great work in you so that the service of the house of the Lord, which is in you, will be set in order. Do not play around with sin. Do not let the works of the flesh continue. Do not have one foot in the world. Don't, do not allow yourself to, to not be committed wholly to follow the Lord. That is a great mistake. Here we see in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 3, here, it's when they were going to be speaking, they were going to be keeping the, the Passover in the second month at this point. Uh, it says they couldn't keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently. That means there's levels of sanctification. They hadn't sanctified themselves sufficiently yet. They hadn't done enough of this work. I mean, we just don't do a little bit of the work. Say, well, I've done some things. Well, good, but God wants us to do the complete work. Don't just put the brakes on. Get the whole work done. Sanctify yourself sufficiently to accomplish this great work in your life. Verse 8. He said, don't be stiff-necked. This means to be stubborn. You can't be stubborn. They were hardening their necks as their fathers were. But yield yourselves unto the Lord. Stubbornness hinders you. Rebellion, disobedience, these things hinder you from doing what God wants and seeing this work. You've got to yield yourself, surrender yourself, put him first place, enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever. You're going to enter in to this holy, sacred place of you being sanctified because you're going to work out your own salvation. And then what's going to happen? You're going to serve the Lord. And why is that important? That the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. Otherwise, if you don't do what he says... There's going to be judgments coming. God expects us to do this work. He's called you. Remember, this is a covenant of holiness and sanctification that he has set. And you and I are to see this be accomplished in our life. Verse 11. There were some that were resistant and they weren't doing it. He says, Nevertheless, diverse of Asher and Manasseh and Zebulun humbled themselves. Ah, they humbled themselves. Remember, they had to yield themselves. See, all pride's got to go. As long as pride's there, you're not going to be yielding yourself. You'll be doing what you want to do. The I, 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 me, me mentality has got to be eliminated. No, we totally submit what the Lord wants us to do. We're going to walk in His ways. And they came to Jerusalem. Jerusalem means teaching of peace, which means they came to the true teaching. We need humility, humbling ourselves, submitting, yielding to God, and we need the true teaching of the Word of God which is going to produce all the blessings in our life, the teaching of peace. He's going to bring forth all the things that he wants to in our life. Verse 12, Also in Judah, the hand of God was to give them one heart. That's what God wants. We don't have, can't have a divided heart. We've got to have one heart. One heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. You're going to have one heart to do the word. You're going to be so set to do the word of God that you are going to see this great work of sanctification accomplished in your life. We see in Isaiah chapter 5, over in verse 16, something else. He says, The Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. That tells us, if you're going to see this sanctification work, it's going to come because of righteousness in you. You are going to walk after the word of righteousness, you're going to do what is right in His sight. We're not going to have any unrighteousness in us. That's what sin produces. We confess our sin and we repent and turn away from it so we can see this sanctification come forth in our life. We see something else that's important in order to see the sanctification work, and that is having the fear of the Lord before us. Isaiah 8.13 says, Sanctify the Lord of hosts Himself, and let Him be your fear, and let Him be your dread. 
They needed the fear of God before them. See, the problem was they were fearing the people. says, a confederacy to all them that this people say a confederacy, and these shall neither fear you their fear, be not afraid. Otherwise, being afraid of the people. They were afraid of the people. They were being moved by it. Instead, he says, sanctify the Lord himself and let him be your fear. If you have the fear of God, you're going to obey him and God is going to fight your battles and he's going to conquer your enemies in your life. We see further, the sanctification work will bring you to the place of being mighty. Remember, God is raising up the mighty army that's going to be powerful and full of might in these last days. Look what he says in Isaiah 13:3. I have commanded my sanctified ones. Those are the ones that have seen this covenant work be accomplished. I've also called my mighty ones, strong and mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. Otherwise, he's going to use us. Use us to bring forth the things that he wants. The mighty ones are going to come forth. You and I are going to execute the judgments that are going to come as we're going to speak the word of God. We're going to see people one to the Lord. But I tell you, there's going to be judgments that are going to come. God is going to have a mighty army that is going to speak forth His Word. It's going to bring blessing on those who receive, those who will not. There will be judgments that will come upon them. God wants you to have the fear of the Lord. He wants you to be mighty. And you're going to go forth and you're going to destroy the enemy in your life. We see in Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28 down in verse 25. Thus saith the Lord God, when I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered and shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen, then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob. Notice, they're going to be sanctified and then they're going to dwell on their land. Sanctified first, then they dwell on the land. Dwell on the land is dwelling in the promises, possessing the promises. What comes first? This sanctification work is going to come in your life. Now, over in the New Testament, we see that Jesus is the one who is accomplishing this work in your life through the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, speaks of two things. Both he that sanctifieth, this is the Lord who is doing this work, and this is an ongoing work because this is a present tense, present tense, denoting ongoing, continuous act. He is sanctified, ongoing process. And they who are sanctified, it sounds like it's already been an accomplished work there, but it's not. It's present tense. It shouldn't be a past tense. Instead, it would be those who are being sanctified, showing this process of work. So the Lord is the one who's doing the sanctifying work, and it's happening you and I who are being sanctified. We're all of one, for which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. In other words, God considers you one with him and considers you a brother or sister in the Lord if you are seeing his sanctifying work going forth in your life who are being sanctified. If you're not, then you're resisting him. And certainly, he would not, we would not be one with him, and we would, he would be ashamed of us instead. No. He's not ashamed to call them brethren, the ones who are doing the things that he says. We see in Hebrews chapter 10, over in verse 14, For by one offering hath he perfected forever. We talked about going on to perfection. Bringing this to perfection, who are the ones have perfected forever by Jesus' one offering? He provided it for us. Who? Them who are sanctified again. People have read this and assume this is talking about it's a finished work when you're born again. Not so. The word sanctified here, it looks like it's past tense, like a completed work. But again, it's a mistake. Present tense. The way you would translate this is them who are being sanctified. Otherwise, this work is ongoing and it's work coming forth in your life. So, this is going to be an ongoing work to bring you to the place of perfection in the Lord. We see over in Ephesians chapter 1, and verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. 
You and I have been chosen. This is what God has destined us to from the very foundation of the world that we're to be holy and without blame, blameless. Well, God expects us to be this. We are to be that way. Before I'm in love, as we're operating in love, walking in love towards Him and towards every single person. So, you must realize that this is a call of God upon your life, what He's expecting, and how He's going to bring us to the place of being without blame as we see this work be accomplished. This is a holy calling. Notice what it says here in 2 Timothy 1.9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. A holy calling. Not according to our works of things that we might merit, but according to His own purpose and grace. His purpose, His favor, is a holy calling upon every single one of us. It was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. you got this calling on your life. You've been called to be holy. Every single person who is born again. He wants this to be accomplished in us. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14, he says, Who gave himself for us, Jesus gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. This is a Greek word, anomia, which means lawlessness. That he might redeem us, purchase from all lawlessness, which he has, and then purify unto himself, or make clean, which is what's supposed to happen, you and I, that we might be purified, by the way, or might, might be clean, cleansed unto him, peculiar people. This is important to realize this is not something that's automatic. He did redeem us from all this. He gave himself for us. That's already happened. But the purifying, it looks like he's just going to do it. All in, it's all saying he's going to do this automatically. No, because the word purify is a subjunctive mood verb in the Greek which would be translated that he might purify to himself a peculiar people. When a subjunctive mood is used, it is conditional upon conditions being met. In other words, he can accomplish this purifying and this cleansing work to make you a, one of these peculiar people if we allow it. It's not automatic. That is important. And what's going to be the result of those who come to be a peculiar people? And by the way, peculiar is a word which means a people selected by God to, for, his own, for his own possession, if you see this. Selected by God for his own possession. Who's the ones he's selecting? The ones who are going through the purifying. Otherwise, those are the ones that are chosen. Now, we are called with a call, holy calling. Remember, many are called but only few are chosen. Why are only few chosen? Because they didn't do the work of seeing the purification come to pass. Might purify to himself these people that are selected for his own possession. Otherwise, they've been chosen. Why? Because they obeyed the call of God and entered into the seeing the covenant of sanctification be accomplished. And what's going to be the result of that? They're going to be zealous of good works, because you're going to be prepared for the service of the Lord. You're going to be so zealous to do the things that God wants you to do, because you are a chosen person, people. You are His possession. You have seen this great, mighty work be accomplished in your life. Now, this happens through the building of the spiritual house in you. If you are going to see the sanctification come to pass, you've got to see the building of God be accomplished. And there's no shortcut to it. It's little by little, line upon line, here little, there little, precept upon precept, scripture on scripture, doing the word. 1 Peter 2, 5 says, You as lively stones, remember Jesus is the cornerstone of the house of God. You and I are lively or living stones in the house of God. And how do we come into that? When we're born again, you're a living stone now, so to speak. Our build up, when it says our build up, a spiritual house. This again shows that it's not an accomplished work just because you're a living stone and born again. It is a process that is going to be accomplished in your life. Literally, because it's present tense, it would say you as lively stones are being built up continuously. This is the work that's going on. A spiritual house. That's why you've got to be sure you're only building the right things. Don't be building wrong things. 
remember, where all of our works are going to be judged. And, you know, everybody's building something. You want to make sure you're not building the wrong thing. If you've been building a bunch of hay, wood, and stubble, it's all going to be burned up, remember. We've got to be building the right thing. We are being built up. And by the way, you know, you are, have a part to play, but remember who's doing the work in you. It's the Lord. How do you know? Because it's passive voice. That means that the subject, which is you and me, the living stones, are being built up by somebody else, a spiritual house. Who's doing the work? God. How does he do it? Through his word that you hear and do. As you carry out this work, how do we build the spiritual house? Hear and do, and hear and do, and hear and do. Remember, when it talks about the guy who was a continual hearer and a continual doer, he's the one that built his house like on a, on a, on a rock, and the storms couldn't destroy him. But the guy who was a hearer but didn't do the word, he built it on sand, and when the storms, the enemy came, he got blown away and he had a great fall. In other words, the way you're building your spiritual house is by being a hearer and a doer of the word consistently. That's why. We always encourage you, as you're hearing the word, do it. Put it into operation in your life. Another thing, if we're going to see this work of sanctification, you've got to present your body to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Look what it says in Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Our body is to be a living sacrifice that we've given. A sacrifice is something that you give. You give yourself, your body, as a living sacrifice. And what's it to be? Holy. Holy. That means we can't be yielding our body unto anything that's unclean. We can't let anything evil come into our body. Holy, acceptable, or well-pleasing unto God, which is your reasonable service. See, You've now been bought. Remember, he bought the whole thing, spirit, soul, and body. Even though your body is still a body of death, he bought the whole thing. That's why we're to glorify him in our spirit and in our body, which are God's, if you remember. It talks about Corinthians. So you and I are living sacrifice. They present our bodies a living sacrifice. Make sure that you only yield your body to the things that are holy before the Lord. Do not let the enemy have place. That's why we've got to guard ourselves. First Timothy, or First Corinthians chapter three. First Corinthians chapter three. He says in verse sixteen, "Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defiles, or this also means to destroy the temple of God, him shall God destroy." Huh, we can't be yielding things. You're the temple of God. You're to be holy. You're for the temple of God is holy. Which temple? You are. That's why we can't be yielding to anything that's not of the Lord. That's why it talks about your works back here, preceding that, about how every work's going to be made manifest of what sort it is. And if, it, if things you've built are abiding, you're going to receive a reward. But if it gets burned, you're going to suffer loss. You don't want to suffer loss. And he says, you're the temple of God, and God's come to dwell in you. We cannot defile the temple of God. You are to be holy before the Lord. Now, if we're going to be holy, we can't just put on an outside holiness facade. No, that doesn't work. It's got to be on the inside, doesn't it? Matthew 23, 25. What was the problem with the scribes and Pharisees? Oh, they, they tried to make everything look good on the outside. Inside, they were a mess. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites, he said. You make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean. Also, you and I should be working on cleansing the inside of us. Get, the clean, get cleansed. Get set free from all these bondages in your life. And of course, we have to have a heart that is right before the Lord. Remember, God is looking upon our heart. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Otherwise, we want to be separate. This is, again, separate from profane things, dedicated to God, consecrated to Him, purified, cleansed, holy before Him in your heart. Guard your heart. Don't let any evil stuff get in your heart. Watch what you're thinking. Watch what you're seeing. Watch what you're hearing. All these are gates into your heart. 
got to guard yourself. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason, the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Sanctifying, having our heart set apart for the Lord. You've got to give your heart unto Him, and that is so important. Over in Romans, we see something else. How we're going to see this covenant of sanctification and holiness be come forth in our life. Romans 6, down in verse 19. He says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity or weakness of your flesh. As you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness, uh, we can't be doing that anymore, and to lawlessness, onomium is the word here, lawlessness, which produces unto more lawlessness in your life, it'll increase. Even so now, see that's what we did in the past. Well, we can't be doing that anymore. Yield your members, all of your faculties, that's what you hear, your ears, what you see with your eyes, what you're thinking with your mind, what you're speaking with your tongue, what you're putting your hands to, the steps you're walking in, all of your members. Now, yield your members, servants, to righteousness. Servants to righteousness. You're going to walk in the way of righteousness. What does that produce? Unto holiness. That means... Without yielding your members as servants to righteousness, you'll never see holiness come forth in your life. We've got to yield ourselves. He goes on and says, you were the servants of sin. We're not a servant of sin anymore. Don't think you're a sinner saved by grace and still a sinner. It's a lie. You are now righteous in spirit. You are sanctified and set apart in spirit. Before, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you in those things whereof you're now ashamed? You know, it was all bad fruit, wasn't it? But the end of those things is death, and it causes us a lot of problems, didn't it? He goes on and says, Being now made free from sin, which we are, and become servants to God, which you are, you have your fruit unto holiness. And what's evident that you are a servant to God? You are being obedient to righteousness, obeying the word of God, producing righteousness. And the fruit, the fruits of righteousness, produce holiness. And what's the end result of that? Ever lasting life, which is what God wants to bring forth in you and me. That's what he's going to accomplish. Also, he's going to deal with you again in your heart. He's going to purge out everything, including your conscience. You should not have anything in your conscience which would smite at you or work at you. Hebrews 9, 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge Make clean your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In other words, otherwise, how did our conscience get messed up through all the dead works? It means your dead things you do that are contrary to His word, they affect you in your conscience. You've got to get rid of that. Oh, we're going to get cleansed from all that, and we're going to serve the living God. We're now going to serve Him. And He wants us also to cleanse our hands. Don't be touching anything that's unclean any longer. James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw nigh to God, He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, or those who have been walking in sin is what he's talking about. This actually means those that have been devoted to sin or following the way of sin or those that are not free of sin. We're not talking about a nature. We don't have, we don't have a sin nature. We are now righteous in nature and spirit. He's talking about those that are not free from sin. Purify your hearts, be double-minded. So, we need to get cleansed from areas where we have sin, and we need to purify our hearts, and that involves our mind and our soul realm, where it says double-minded. This is actually the word disukos, which means double-minded or two-souled, more literally, as Young's brings out. Two-souled. That's why you've got to make sure you are single-minded on the Word. You're not giving place to the enemy. You're, you're one soul. You want it united together with your walking in the way of the Spirit, not letting yourself have a divide, to be divided in that way. So you're going to guard yourself. You're going to draw an eye to God, of course, is the way this is going to happen. You're going to seek after Him. You're going to cleanse your hands of all sin and purify your hearts so that your soul is single-minded upon the Word of God. We also see in John, chapter 15. John, chapter 15, verse 3. 
He says, in this misunderstanding here, when you don't quite understand what's being said here, it says, you are clean through the word which I've spoken to you, like it was already accomplished. No, the word through here, because this is, in the Greek, the word here for word, that this is going through the word, the word is in the accusative case, which means the way you translate it, it is when it's in the accusative, this word dia is translated because of. That's what it should have been. What it says is already, now you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. The point being is the word is what's going to accomplish this cleanness in your life if you, of course, take hold of it. They had heard the word because of the word spoken to them. They'd taken hold of it, and it caused a cleansing work in their life. So, just not just because you heard the word, it's what you do with the word. Because of the word that's been spoken, and that you have taken hold of it, of course, and applied it in your life, you've gone through the cleansing process that we talk about. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, he cleanses it, so it can bring forth more fruit. We've got to cleanse it ourselves so we can bring forth more fruit in our life. If we don't go through the cleansing process, we'll never get to the more fruit stage in our life. And of course, this sanctifi sanctification process is going to happen through the Word in you. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. The Word is truth. The Word in you is the key. You can't do the sanctification part by yourself, by your own willpower, by your own choices, apart from the Word of God. No, it's the Word in you that you receive and you do and put it in operation. The Word is truth, and that is going to produce the sanctification work in your life. He goes on, he says, For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Jesus was speaking. Jesus said he was sanctified, separating himself, of course. He had to walk the walk. So that they might be sanctified through the truth. Jesus was our example. Everything he did is what we're to do so that we can see the truth produce the sanctification work in our life. We also see over in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. Here it's speaking about the husbands loving the wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And then speaking of the Christ giving himself for the church that he might sanctify it and this here is talking about this work being accomplished if the conditions are met, because it is a subjunctive mood, that he might sanctify it if the, if, if the conditions are met. Then it goes on and says, and cleanse it. It makes you think it's talking about another thing here, but it's not a good translation because this word here, cleanse, means it's not an, an indicative word. It is a participle. It's not indicative, but it's a participle. The way you translate a participle in the Greek is what Young's has done. Young's done an outstanding job here. Having cleansed it. In other words, it's telling you how the sanctification comes to pass. That he might sanctify it, that's the, with, the, with the condition being having cleansed it with the bathing of the water in the Word, or the washing the water by the Word. So how are we going to see the sanctification come? Having cleansed the church is what it's talking about with the washing of the water by the Word. So as you and I are getting cleansed through the Word of God in our life, then that means we've met the conditions to see the sanctification be accomplished. And what's going to be the end result? That he might present it to himself a glorious church. See, the sanctified church will be a glorious church. The glory of God's going to be poured out upon it. That's why this covenant of sanctification, holiness, is absolutely essential to see it accomplished in our life. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. That's where you and I are going to come to. The covenant of sanctification and holiness. We've, we're going to stop at this point. We've got much more to talk about tonight as we continue on. But what we've seen this morning is this. This covenant of sanctification and holiness, remember, it speaks of you being separate, dedicated, consecrated, purified, cleansed, holy, totally separate unto the Lord. And we see the fact that this is what God wants to bring forth in your life now, 
and it's going to be what is going to be in the millennial reign, everybody that's going to be there, uh, holiness will be the standard, holiness to the Lord. It's accomplished through the Word and by the Holy Spirit. God has chose every one of us unto salvation through sanctification of the Spirit as we received and got born again and got a brand new spirit. And remember, all those firstborn he considers are sanctified. That means you and I are separated and set apart unto him. We just need to know that. Now walk that walk in our life. There is a way of holiness. This work is going to be done in the church age. Through the 2,000 years, you and I are to be cleansed. Every one of us are to become righteous. We cannot have iniquity in our life. Our members are to be cleansed as we yield ourselves unto God. We're going to be sanctified by the glory of God manifest in our life. We're going to put on His holy garments. We're going to get rid of everything that's unclean. We're not going to have anything unholy before Him. We're going to sanctify ourselves through the Word of God. We're going to get rid of the fleshly works. We're going to wash our clothes and get rid of everything that's not of Him. We're going to make sure that we believe His Word, not rebel, and no, no sin. That's what caused uh, Moses to make a mistake, and it cost him. God is coming in the church to deliver it, to be holy, that he finds no uncleanness or nakedness in us. You are to be and I to be righteous. As you are sanctified, you will see miraculous works happening in your life. If you're not sanctified, you have a cursed thing, you've got sin, you can't stand against your enemy, you won't be able to win your battles at all. And everything is to be gotten rid of. Even a little bit of iniquity, it will cause the plague in the congregation. Uh, don't think there's any little part that I, I can just kind of get away with. No, everything needs to be cleansed. As you and I get sanctified, we'll be able to offer up sacrifices unto the Lord acceptably. And as you and I are being sanctified, become one and righteous, the glory of God will fill us. As you see this sanctification work, God's eyes and heart are actually going to come into you. You're going to see like Him. You're going to have a heart like Him to carry out what He wants. Every one of us must come into the soul, the holy place, and carry all the filthiness out. Every bit, of, every bit of it needs to be done. It is going to be a process. When it's done, it'll be like a new beginning in your life. Unfortunately, there were some that did the work quickly. That was the few. The rest of them were lax, and they weren't doing the work. And the service of the house was not set in order. God wants you to get yourself set in order. Do this work. Don't be lazy. Don't be slothful. Don't be lax behind. See this work be done in your life. And we see as we yield and enter in, be sanctified, then we'll be able to serve the Lord. And that's because we've humbled ourselves and gotten the true teaching and have come to the place of one heart to do the commandment of the Lord. So we do righteousness and we walk in the fear of the Lord and we become mighty to do the works of God and we are sanctified. We'll come to the place of dwelling in Him. Remember, the Lord is doing this work. It is a holy calling that He's called us from the foundation of the world. We are to be purified, so we'll be zealous of good works. You are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. As you let this accomplish and be accomplished in your life, you're to present your body, a living sacrifice that's holy. Do not defile it or it will be destroyed. Uh, cleanse the inside so the outside will be cleansed. Be sanctified in heart. Yield your members unto righteousness that produces holiness. Be purged of everything that is not of the Lord. Be cleansed. And as this work is being accomplished in your life and in my life, what's going to happen? You and I are going to come to the place of being sanctified, having been cleansed to be the glorious church as we see. No spot, no wrinkle, holy, without blemish before the Lord. This is the covenant of sanctification and holiness. God has said it in His Word. He told us to do it, sanctify yourselves, but He also is going to be the one, Him accomplishing it, because He's the one who is doing that work in us. It will get accomplished as you follow what He says. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank You and praise You for the Word of God that reveals the covenant of sanctification and holiness which you will perform in my life. I thank you. I will be a doer of your word and I will see this covenant be manifest in my life because I will do all that you say and see the sanctification be accomplished in all areas 
of my life. I will be holy. And I will be a part of the glorious church. Without spot. Without wrinkle. Holy. And without blemish. The glorious church. In these last days. Thank you for accomplishing this in me as I'm obedient to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We got so far, and we've got many more to talk about in the New Testament, and we'll be finishing that up tonight as we go through, and we'll be talking more on the results of holiness as well and what it will accomplish for you in your life. God wants us to be holy. Every one of us can be holy. Don't think that, oh, that just sounds like it's impossible. No, it's a lie. God is doing the work in you in a measure. He's already done some things. Let him have his way to accomplish every work. Get in the word. Hear the word. Do the word. Don't let the enemy have place. Conquer everything. Be totally yielded to the Lord. He will do this great work in you. And you keep casting out the demons to get rid of them and walk in the way of the Lord. God is going to do a total cleansing in your life. Father, I thank you for all that you're accomplishing. Thank you for this wonderful covenant that you are accomplishing in our life. We are doers of it. We will see it. We praise you for the work you have done and what you're continuing to do to manifest the fulfillment of the covenant of sanctification and holiness in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.